Welcome back, everybody. This Week in America, website thisweekinamerica.us. As mentioned on the program today, Eric Falkenstein he is a Ph.D. economist from Northwestern, having written his dissertation on the low volatility effect back in 1994. He's worked as an economist, a risk manager, a financial quant, default modeler, and portfolio manager. He's worked for banks, for hedge funds, and Moody's. He's written for several academic journals, including the Journal of Finance, and published two books, Finding Alpha and the Missing Risk Premium. That's what we'll be talking about on today's program. His home website is efalken, F-A-L-K-E-N.com. Currently, he's an equity portfolio manager for Pine River Capital Management, headquartered in Minneapolis. He currently works uh, in the work there, centers on ideas related to theories outlined in his books. Again, the books are Finding Alpha. And the book we're talking about today, The Missing Risk Premium. Eric, welcome to the program. Great to have you with us on the show. Hey, great to be here, Rick. So much to talk about during the course of this program. And and you start off, and again, Eric's website is very simple, falken, F-A-L-K-E-N.com. Eric Falkenstein, our guest on the program. You outline a very important flaw in finance as the academic notion of risk. Let's let's start there and sort of lay out the principle, the premise of, of what it is you're discussing in the book and, and what we all can learn from this. Right. Well, you know, economics is, is based on studying like the emergent properties of individual behavior. And so Adam Smith started by saying people are selfish and then you get this invisible hand. And that was surprising. And, and that's really what spawned economics. Uh, you didn't look at aggregates and, and you looked at individuals and saw the, the, the effects. Um, so, uh, you know, in, in the 1860s, they had this idea of utility and they've come up with this uh, idea that, you know, when, when you get ice cream, you, you like it, and the more ice cream, the better, but you like it less and less every time. And that idea was really useful in, in explaining uh, how, how basically uh, marginal costs relate to you, like your, your satisfactions and, and the, the relative prices kind of mediate that, and it was very successful. Uh, but then they applied that to your whole bundle of wealth. And so basically, the economists think that all we care about is, is wealth. Um, and, and you like more of it, and, and that's it. And, and I think that's fundamentally flawed in, in a very subtle way. And we, we care about, more than that, we care about status. We wanna, you know, humans are social. We wanna succeed, for a human to succeed, we have to succeed socially. So we're interested in status or, or relative wealth. Um, you know, I'm, I'm, most of us are, are much wealthier than our great-grandparents. Um, but, you know, the poor today live better than our great-grandparents did, but they're, they're not happy. Uh, it's your relative status that matters. And, and that has all sorts of interesting implications. Uh, in, in my books, I focus on one because it has an implication for this thing called a risk premium. Um, but it has all sorts of other implications, too. You know, a lot of talk is about redistribution as opposed to efficiency. And, and it has always been this way. And I think that makes sense because people are concerned about their relative standing. Um, but I spend my time just on one little narrow area. I think it generalizes, um, you know, for the 100,000 or so B-school students they learn this thing, you know, utility implies uh, a risk premium. And, you know, it's really important. Uh, and, and I think the risk premium is like the ether of physics of the 19th century, where it's, it's supposed to be omnipresent and important, but it's also really hard to measure. And then they found that they couldn't measure it because it didn't exist. And Einstein showed that, you know, you didn't need ether. Um, and similarly, you know, the risk premium is supposed to be important and omnipresent, and it never exists and no one can ever find it. Uh, so I think it's, it's, it's just a waste of time and there, there's some simple implications for that. And, uh, it, you know, it's, for me, it's fascinating. It's an interesting bit of well, it, yeah. history. And it's a fascinating book. It's called the missing risk premium, how low volatility, uh, investing works. Eric Faltenstein is our guest on the program. The book is available on Amazon all across the country. Information at Eric's website, which is very simple. That's e falken, F A L K E N.com. Let's say you've been actively involved in, in finance now for over 20 years. Let's talk about how, how this theory, your evolution in terms of this theory and understanding maybe what we've been led to believe for years really isn't the best way to, to attack this. Right. Well, you know, it, it, when I was doing my dissertation, I had this idea that, you know, well, I found empirically that, that the high volatility stocks had lower returns, and, and I didn't have a good theory back then. Um, I, I just thought, well, people are overconfident. So they're buying these highly risky stocks. Um, and then back then it wasn't considered a good idea because theoretically that shouldn't happen. And then people, people see what they believe more than they believe what they see. Yeah. So, so my, you know, my professors told me I was just wrong and, and uh, you know, I didn't get any, uh, uh, you know, tenure track offers for that. But I, but I thought that was fine because I could go make money on it. 
And, um, and then I found it was really hard to sell uh, the idea that low volatility actually has a higher return because supposedly risk and return exist in this karmic equilibrium. So if you want higher return, you have to take higher risk. And I was saying, no, you get a higher return by taking lower risk. And it's like you get something for nothing. And, and so it didn't make any sense. Uh, and I've been trying to peddle that idea uh, basically my, my adult life. And, uh, you know, and I do that now. Um, but then, you know, in the early 2000s, basically, you know, any, any true fact that's out there, it's big. It's going to be found by others. And so several other people documented this independently. Uh, low volatility investing is now a pretty big asset class among, among financial people. Um, but I still don't think the economics profession and everybody has, has really digested it. Um, so, you know, it's still kind of a fringe idea. Um, uh, and and I, I still think it has a lot of legs in terms of people figuring out what, what it means. It, it's uh, because it strikes at the heart of, of what economists do and how they model individuals and their incentives uh, and, and, and all that. Well, it's interesting because we're led to believe that there is a correlation between risk and expected returns. And you mentioned that, that high volatility, we would think, okay, if there's high volatility, uh, there's the possibility of, of higher returns. And you're saying that's just, in theory, that may be the case. In practicality, it, it's, it doesn't work that way. Yeah, but you have it right. There's a possibility of high returns. You know, so if you play the lotto, you can become a centimillionaire. Uh, the thing is, you know, when you, when you buy a lottery ticket for a dollar, the expected, you know, return on that is about negative 80 cents. Um, so, and, and it's that way for, for, for many things, you know, when you buy out of the money horses. Uh, you know, I, I survey in the book about 25 asset classes from like currencies, futures, uh, uh, things like that, commodities, uh, even look at movies. Um, and usually there's n no relation at all between uh, volatility and returns. And, and the second, you know, and, and tied with that, it's negative, you know, just like in lottery tickets. The worst pay on lottery tickets is for the mega millions, not for the little scratch off. Because uh, people are willing to pay a little extra for that uh, chance to become rich. And, uh, you know, and then there's several reasons why. Actually, I wrote a paper this spring about that in this journal Portfolio Management. Like, why do people buy these highly volatile uh, things when, when, at best, they don't have no higher return. And, and there's several reasons. Uh, to me, the main one is overconfident. You know, if you're overconfident, if you think you know what's going to go up, you, you know, you're not going to waste your time deciding whether to buy Pepsi or Coke. You're going to buy Tesla or Facebook, you know, something right. that gets you an upside. And, and so, you know, there's overconfidence. Uh, you know, people have also said, you know, in certain cases, we're risk loving or and, and then there, there's also there's incentive effects. You know, if, if you want to get ahead in, in, in finance, um, you basically need a signature call. And to do that, you've got to take risks. So, you know, you, you want to make, you know, like Henry Blodgett, the famous uh, journalist, he, he, he got famous because he, he said, uh, I think it was Yahoo, would double. And, and indeed they did. And it was an incredibly, you know, prescient move. It was also very lucky, and he knows nothing about finance, which he admitted afterward. Um, but he was very lucky. But that, that catapulted him to stardom. Um, funds, too, you know, they have this what's called a convex payout. You know, the, the, the top funds get this huge inflow of money and the bottom fund flows, you know, it, it's kind of linear. So when you have a convex, convex payout, it's like a call option. That is, if you get in the top decile, you get all this money. And then if you don't, you're kind of treated like everyone else. So there's really, it's asymmetric. So you have all these incentives to, to, to do the, the really risky thing and, and people do it. And, uh, and it's not arbitraged away because of, of what I call you know, since we're, we're relatively oriented, we're all benchmarking, um, it doesn't get arbitraged away in equilibrium. Uh, so, you know, I think that's kind of fun. Well, you talk about risk-taking as a very important life skill, and we really need to understand the nature. Do most of us understand risk-taking? You, know, uh, you know, intuitively everyone does. I think economists take a step backwards because they kind of reify it as this idea of, you know, you have this expected uncertainty and, uh, you know, that, that's all you're trying to manage. And, and I think of it more, you know, in your life, you're going to make many risky decisions and, and, and you should take risk. Uh, you know, at one point I, I document, you know, geneticists have found that only 40% of all males have generated progeny. Uh, which means that, you know, your modal male, your, the, the median male, uh, doesn't, doesn't reproduce. So from an evolutionary perspective, you have to take risk to have survivors. And so we're all the descendants of risk takers. Um, and, and, you know, we have an instinct to, to go out and play and seek. 
um, and find you know defining your niche, finding your comparative advantage takes risk. You know, you you try uh, journalism or, or you know you, you try things. You know, you try a lot of people try the arts and find out they fail. A lot of people try athletics, find they fail. It's fun to try, and when you fail, you move on. And and if you think of it, I mean, that was the theme of my book, Finding Alpha. If you think of risk taking as a sequence of of, of self discovery, um, it, it's a good thing. You know, you know, I think. You know, the Greeks had it better on risk than, than, than modern finance. So they said, you know, two things were at the Oracle Delphi. They said, know thyself in moderation in all things. You know, find what you're good at. And you find what you're good at by taking risks and trying. Um, it, you know, it's interesting. If you look at the unconditional odds of, of succeeding in any field, they're low. I mean, most people are bad singers. They're bad dancers. They're bad, bad at radio. They're bad at book writing. They're, they're bad at blogging. Uh, but you do all these things anyway because, you know, you're, you're probably bad at nine of them. But you try them and you find the one you're good at and you stick at that and you try to get really, really good. And, and I think that's, you know, a better way to think about risk. And then, of course, moderation in all things. The payoff to risk is not linear, which is what theory says. Theory says the more you take risk, the more, more you return. And it's like, no, at some point it becomes reckless. You know, there, there's, a, there's a midpoint between like being, uh, you know, cowardly and, and being rash. And, and that and, and it's context dependent. It depends on your special skills, your knowledge. Um, you know, obviously, the more connections and capital you have, the different your opportunity set. Uh, but it certainly isn't this linear function, irrespective of of who you are and who you know and what you know. Uh, so, so you know, the the, the the people who learn finance every year, I think, are, are being uh, profoundly misled. You're listening to This Week in America, our website, thisweekinamerica.us. Our guest on the program, Eric Falkenstein. He's the author of the book, The Missing Risk Premium, How Low Volatility Investing Works. Information uh, available at our website, thisweekinamerica.us. You can link on to Eric's website, which is efalken, F-A-L-K-E-N dot com. Let's talk about, I think your first trade, you you talk about in the book, the first trade ever in October of, of 1987, you started off with like twenty eight hundred sixty dollars and turned that into a sizable chunk of money within a few days. What did you learn from from that that first trade? Well, I, I learned basically that um, uh, transaction costs uh, shouldn't be trifled with, um, and and so you know I, I made you know a, what I returned to two thousand dollars into like forty five thousand dollars by shorting shorting the market just before the October crash of, of eighty seven, and so then I you know as a twenty two-year-old kid, I said, oh, this is great. I'm a, I'm a stock genius. So I, I figured, well, I'll, I'll, I'll invest. And why don't I invest where I can make the most money, which is options, because you get basically options have embedded leverage. And so I did that. And then I realized, oh, shoot, you know, back then, you know, you're paying transaction costs of like a quarter of a point on a $2 option, you know, so 75 cents on every $2 option you buy is just going to the market maker. Uh, and and quickly, you know, uh, that ate up my cost, and then I had taxes, and so uh, you know, if you look at the top line returns, they're they're not really, you know, so everyone looks at equity returns and says, oh, they have this high return, they returned on average eight percent. Well, you know, the people have done studies, and and uh, you know, things like taxes, uh, you know, adverse timing, um, and all things like that. The average investor makes about five percent less than the top line return in equities. And, um, and and so that was that was one big takeaway. So you can't look at a top line number and say, oh, that's my return. And that's what I did. At first, as I'm reading, it's like, this guy is a genius. And then you're explaining, but that wasn't the bottom line of the transaction. Yeah, right, right. Yeah, and then, and then another thing I learned from that was, you know, they said, well, you know, when you apply to grad school, tell them, tell them about your winning trade. And I said, well, what about all those things I learned afterward, which is taxes and transaction costs can, can turn that great idea into nothing rather quickly because... Um, and uh, they said, no, no, don't mention that. That'll make you look stupid. And uh, and there's a, there's a huge there's a huge bias in the financial industry to you know most most fund complexes outperform the five year LIBOR averages. Why? Because the dead ones they just you know they, they they don't talk about it anymore. And so you know around here, like for example, everybody who applies for a job in finance always has this wonderful track record. Uh, they never talk about their ideas that didn't work. Um, you know, people misrepresent themselves all the time. I mean, even. Even like famous uh, Bob Robert Schiller who talks about he called the market crash. You know, he, it wasn't really a very clear call. He hedged himself and it was very a- ambiguous. And then afterwards, he's like, oh, see, I called it. So there's a lot of misrepresentation. Um, and, 
and, and, and, and, and the risk premium plays to that because risk premium is so imprecise, it plays into deceptive blather. And I think it's really a shame because, you know, the idea that because it's social, it can be this, you know, it, it can be this amorphous thing that's important and omnipresent but not describable is, is silly because, you know, beauty is, is omnipresent and, and kind of indescribable. But actually, there are metrics for beauty. I mean, you can have a computer will tell you pretty well what attractive faces are looking at symmetry and, you know, for women, it's the hip to waist ratio of about 0.7 and things like that. And for some reason, there, there's no metric that determines the risk that people pay for, but it's supposed to be everywhere. And so, uh, so yeah, it's, it, I think, you know, the, the fewer bad ideas we have in finance, the, the better for everyone. The book is called The Missing Risk Premium. Why Low Volatility Investing Works. Eric Falkenstein, our guest on the program. His website is efalken, F-A-L-K-E-N.com. Information at a website, this week at America.us. Time going by quickly. A couple minutes left in the program. You, you, you talk in the book and, and you say the essence of financial wisdom is best reflected by a small set of principles. What are some of the basic principles? And maybe we lose sight and maybe overcomplicating the, this whole process. Well, I think the it's know thyself in moderation in all things. You know, if you take no risk, you're not going to get any return. And maybe if you're not going to put time to it, that's a, that's probably a good thing to do. Yes. You know, your grandmother putting her, her money in the mattress was probably not, not so stupid relative to giving her away to hucksters. Um, th- there are a lot of bad people out there. I mean, they're not evil, but they, they're just selling, um, you know, people who sell options are, are, are 99% of them, I think, are, are, are not doing a good service. Um, you know, Make friends. I mean, most of finance isn't about alpha. It's about connections. It's about being friendly. It's about being helpful. Um, you know, capital connections and ideas work together and you need all three. And so if you just focus on covariances, which is what the academics say, you know, you're missing all of that. I mean, the good ideas in finance, I mean, if you look at the last financial bubble, was a pretty clear idea. If you look back at, oh, these people are getting mortgages, they can't afford them. You know, look for good ideas. There, there are lots of good ideas out there, but you also need friends because because you need connections. Because usually you gotta, you know, put together a trade. Like I work at a firm, I, I couldn't work do this stuff. My ideas only work really at scale. So I need friends. Uh, so it, it's more about that. And, you know, and then, then then most good ideas are kind of sui generis. They're they're not they're not these eternal ideas. I mean, what makes you rich every decade? Changes. I mean, what makes you successful doesn't, you know, because it's, you know, the the classic virtues of prudence and discipline. Right. But 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 the specific things that you know you're going to have to learn something contextual to your time and your talents. You said that many common investment strategies and tactics are as costly as gambling. Does this go back to what we were talking about a, a few minutes ago? The the whole high volatility, the fact that we we feel sometimes for big gains we need big risk. Right, right. Yeah. And so with, with really high volatility, you, you tend not to notice that you're paying a huge transaction cost if every time you make or lose 25%. But, you know, most risk, pre- you know, if you're really good, you can probably make, you know, a 5% return premium on average. And it's really easy to spend that in transaction costs, especially if you're trading several times a year, which many people do. And so, you know, you just just have to learn to have some discipline, not to trade so much. Uh, just remember, every time you trade, it's costly, and and that's fine. And if you're trying to figure out what you're good at, but at some point you got to settle down and be part of a discipline process uh, because all that goes to the middleman. That's why you know where are the customers' yachts. The finance guys are rich basically because they're getting paid for transaction costs. They're not getting paid to you know uh, take risk. Got about a minute left in the program. Do we get into trouble? It's so easy now. I mean, I can get on my computer. I can change my portfolio every night. And I know people that treat it almost like a video game. Is that where we get into trouble when rather than find something, think it through, have a good strategy and leave it, that we get, it's too easy for us to make changes? Yeah, it, it really is. Uh, you know, I mean, I'm, I'm a libertarian. I think people should be allowed to make mistakes and, and do what they want. And, and if you protect them, they'll, they'll find ways around it to ruin themselves. But, you know, this is something every child and adult has to learn is that basically trading is costly and you don't get paid for taking risk. You don't get, you know, to be successful, you have to be unconventional. You have to take risks, but you don't get paid merely for taking risks or merely for being unconventional. For that, it's costly. So just remember, when you take risks, on average, especially if you don't know what you're doing, uh, you know, you're not going to get paid for it. And, and, and those guys on TV who encourage, 
Uh, you know, they, they show on TV those guys with the trade station platforms. Yes. It says if you trade 36 times a year, you get this fancy platform. Don't do it. Uh, that, that's a waste of money. So, like, one of my implications is simply, you know, trade less, buy low volatility, boring stuff. You know, if it's your job like me, fine. And even then, I should, you know, just make sure I don't trade too much. Because even in my profession, I, I see people uh, trading more than they should. Because, uh, like I said, if you're making or losing a lot on every trade, you, you tend not to pay attention to those little costs. It's like, oh, that was just 1%. It's like, well, yeah, but if you do it, you know, it's the central limit there. After 20 times, it's 20%. So, In the book, The Missing Risk Premium, Why Low Volatility Investing Works, Eric says the sad fact of investing, that it pays to be smart and costs to be stupid. I guess we will leave that with people. That sort of sums it up very succinctly, you know, what we're all facing in this situation. Eric Falkenstein, our guest on the program. The book, again, The Missing Risk Premium, Why Low Volatility Investing Works. Information available at Eric's website, efalken, F-A-L-K-E-N.com. The book's available at Amazon around the country as well. And, of course, information available at our website, thisweekinamerica.us. Eric, it's been a pleasure. Thank you for joining us. Yeah, and don't forget the other book, the first one, uh, Finding Alpha, that's available as well. Eric, thank you for joining us. Look forward to having you back in the program. Great book, fascinating discussion. Thank you for joining us. Thank you, Rick. You're welcome. You're listening to This Week in America, website This Week in America. Dot U.S.